In the Times Plus, we did a thank you to our 3C media team for their hard work regarding regularly scheduled services and also various special services like tonight. Uh, we've had somebody up there for hours, so thank you to <laughs> Keith and Don. <clears throat> so it'd be very difficult without them. So we'll start with an opening prayer from Jude. Our Old Testament reading from tonight is from Psalm 8. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place. What is humankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet all flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, 
all that swim the paths of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Please rise in spirit and stand as you are able for the reading of God's word from the letter to the Galatians, <clears throat> chapter 4, 4 through 7. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, in order to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as children. And because you are children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a child. And if a child, then also an heir through God. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> I just have a few really brief points. If you have a slight case of narcolepsy like I do, you might miss some of them. If you have a really bad case, you, you will miss them. So those are really great readings. Um, those were from the lectionary options for today. A lot of churches, like the Catholic Church that I grew up in, have uh, services New Year's Eve night and New Year's Day, and those are some of the readings that I really like. Psalm 8 is great. You probably know the song, Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. <clears throat> but I think both of these readings really have meaning for us in the Christmas season and in, in the new year. In Psalm 8, it talks about humankind and how great it is that God is so mindful of us and cares so much for us that we're really at the pinnacle of his creation. You crowned them with glory and honor. And so that speaks to me about how special we are, how important we are. And then in the second reading from Paul's letter to the Galatians, it talks about Jesus who came to redeem those of us who were under the law. So that clearly talks about how important we are to God. And it talks about our adoption as children. And if you've been around here and heard J.R. preach, you know that in these times, in the biblical times, Adoption was a level higher even than having your own child. In our society now, we seem to really prize having your own child. And we think about, for instance, in the GLBT community, how terrible it is if someone disowns their child, uh, especially because of something the child is, the child's sexual orientation or something like that. But if you think about biblical times, it wasn't so terrible to disown one's child. I, you know, if a child was disobedient or didn't follow God's law and so forth, then it was more likely for them to be disowned. But if you were adopted, that was something you couldn't undo. That was a lifelong commitment, kind of like it is today. But in today's courts, it probably can sometimes be undone in certain circumstances. And back then, I don't think it was. So I think that's why Paul chose the word adoption, meaning once we're God's children, which we are, nothing can undo that. There's no evil, there's no circumstance, there's nothing that can undo it. We're permanently God's children. <clears throat> so those are my comments about the readings. I think they're pretty self-explanatory. But I want to talk about what does it mean if we're the pinnacle of God's creation and we're God's children, what does that mean for us going into 2016? I was reading something... I don't know if it was on Facebook or where, that talked about the old year, the end of the old year, can be a time to take out the trash. And I'm sure there are some things from 2015 that we could take out. There might be some guilt, there might be some anger, there might be some anxiety that we really don't need to take into the, into the new year. So I invite you during this service to think about what you could leave behind. But I also want you to think about what you could take with you into the new year. And I think because God did make us the pinnacle of his creation and because we're his children, it gives us some things to think about in terms of what do we do with that. And there are five quick things that I got from Facebook to present. One of them, and I'm going to give these to you on a handout when we're finished at the end of service, is talks about mourning. But I see that 
as something we can do every morning, but certainly something we can do in a new year. It says, mourning is God's way of saying one more time, go make a difference, touch a heart, encourage a mind, inspire a soul, and enjoy the day. So if we're God's children, there are other brothers and sisters that are also God's children, and these are just a few things we can do for them. Each morning is an opportunity to say these things or do these things, to make a difference, touch a heart, to encourage and inspire and enjoy the day, because each day is a gift. The next one says, the phrase, do not be afraid, is written in the Bible 365 times. So if I had looked all those up, which I didn't, I could give you a big sheet and you could just read one every day. Every day there'd be a new verse telling you not to be afraid. Now I think this is going to be a leap year this year, so you would have to read one twice. Okay? <clears throat> but it says do not be afraid. And when people think about, okay, well you say go make a difference, touch a heart, encourage people and all that. Well, I might be afraid that I'll say the wrong thing. Or maybe I'll do it when God wasn't ready for me to do it at that time or I don't know enough scripture, or I don't know enough theology. But as J.R. often says, you can just tell someone what God's done for you. And you might think, well, what if they don't want to hear all that? Sometimes it might be that the person just needs a hug, or someone to listen to them for a minute, or just to even be acknowledged. Hey, how are you doing? You know, there might be someone on the pew, or sitting in a pew by themselves, or somewhere at work, sitting alone, eating lunch, this may be lonely. So there are all kinds of things we can do, and God wants us to not be afraid. That doesn't mean don't be careful, don't use your head. I'm not saying don't be afraid to walk out in traffic. But don't be afraid to do something nice for someone else. You don't have to be in control, though. The next one says, I'm not in control, but I'm deeply loved by the one who is. And that kind of goes back to that first reading. God made us the pinnacle of his creation. Obviously, he loves us. The second reading, God sent his son to redeem us. We're heirs, we're his children. Obviously, he loves us. So I'm not in control means to me, one thing it can mean is I can plant a seed or I can water a seed. It's up to God to do the rest. So sometimes you might offer something nice, a gesture, and the person just turns away, turns it down, or says, no, I don't need any help. Okay, but you offered it. That doesn't, that's not a failure. Okay, We can try to do what we think God wants us to do. All we can do is the best we know of God's will at the moment. It may not be received. Be okay with that. You still offered it. Let God be in control of it. And then, since we're deeply loved, we know all of God's children are deeply loved. Some of God's children are broken. And the next one I picked out from Facebook says, How we walk with the broken speaks louder than how we sit with the great. So I encourage you to think about in 2016, how do you deal with people in their brokenness? Because it's quite natural to think, ooh, I don't feel good in that situation. I don't know what to say. I might not say the right thing. And if you're afraid of that, remember the Bible says not to be afraid, but sometimes less is more. You might not have to say anything. You can just sit with the person. You can pat them on the back or hug them. You might not have to say anything. It could be someone who's going through a loss, a personal loss, relationship, job, loved one passed away or whatever. I love you. I'm here for you. There don't have to be a lot of words. Sometimes just your presence says a lot. So how we walk with the broken, I think, is important. And the last one talks about Christmas. And as I said, I grew up in the Catholic Church, so for us, Christmas started on Christmas Day, and then there was a whole season of Christmas. The decorations didn't stay up for months, but they did stay up until Epiphany. But the point of it was, the homilies would often be about, okay, now that we've had Christmas, what do we do with it? How do we live that out? Rather than just Christmas is one day. So I'm not saying there's a right way or a wrong way, that's just the way it was when I grew up. And this is a, a quote from Howard Thurman that will also be on your, your take-home sheet. And I really like this for the post-Christmas season. It says, when the song of the angels is stilled, when the star in the sky is gone, when the kings and princes are home, 
when the shepherds are back with their flock, the work of Christmas begins. To find the lost, to heal the broken, to feed the hungry, to release the prisoner, to rebuild the nations, to bring peace among people, to make music in the heart. So that's what I encourage you to think about as we go into 2016, is how can you do some of those things? And it doesn't have to be a lost homeless person downtown. It could be, but it could be a person in your family, your circle of influence, your church, who is lost for some reason. Maybe not physically lost. Someone who is broken, I talked about some of those people. People who are hungry, people who are prisoners, could be people who are hungry for friendship. People who are prisoners of loneliness, or prisoners of guilt, or prisoners of something in their past, who might just need encouragement. Even, and you don't even, know, have, I mean, you don't even have to know what the issue is to be encouraging. To rebuild the nations, to bring peace among people. That can be peace among our family, peace among friends, peace among church members, peace among co-workers. And again, just planting a seed. Not that you have to be in control and manage it, manipulate it, make sure it works. But maybe God gives you a word to say, and then it may be up to God whether those people receive it and run with it and use it or not. But God may call us to be sowers. Right? To make music in the heart. To continue to do things that speak to your heart. Like for me, it's listening to praise music. Whatever lifts you up and keeps your heart light would be things to, to try to do in 2016 as well. So that's kind of my prayer, that we remember that we are the pinnacle of God's creation, that we don't have to be afraid of God or too afraid that we'll do the wrong thing but just to reach out and offer and hope that it's received in the spirit in which we offer it. So that there may be some things, some trash we need to take out, some things we need to leave behind in 2015, and we'll have a prayer time after communion, a brief prayer time in case you would like to come up and be anointed. Um, if you need any one-on-one -on -one prayer, I can be around available after that. But I encourage you to think about what to leave behind in 2015 and maybe something new that God might want you to consider for 2016. So as we prepare for communion, I invite us to take a few minutes to think about things that we would like to let go of that we may have done or not done, things that may have made us feel separated from God, even though God didn't move, we may have felt like we were distant from him, things that may have separated us from other people or the best in ourselves. Let's take a moment to confess those to God before we move to communion. Amen. God's forgiveness helps us. It says in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, that if we confess our sins to God, he does forgive us. So please know that whatever you've confessed to him, he wants you to let go of and know that you are forgiven. Amen? Jesus knew over 2,000 years ago that we would need a tangible reminder of his great love for us. So in that Last Supper meal he had with his disciples, he took the bread, he lifted it up to heaven and blessed it, and he broke it, and shared it with each and every one of them, without exception, saying, this is my body, which will be broken for all of you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, 
Lifting it up to heaven, he gave thanks and blessed it, and he passed it to each and every one there, saying, This is the new blood of my covenant that will be shed for you and for all, for forgiveness of sin. Do this in memory of me. If you feel comfortable, stretch forth your hands as we consecrate these elements. Holy Spirit, we have before us the bread and the juice, and we ask you to consecrate it to become for us the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. At this table, we invite everyone to come. Jesus invited everyone. In case you don't feel worthy, remember all 12 were there and all 12 received. And Jesus invites everyone to receive this gift. We hope that you will receive it with an open heart, asking Jesus to lead you to wherever he wants to take you and whatever he wants you to do in 2016. There may be some people who are letting go of some things, they may need some quiet moments with Jesus at this time. And as I said, we'll have prayer after the service if anyone needs it. Please come and receive the gifts of God. Can come forward and just go in either direction. Lord, we thank you for this wonderful table of blessing and hope as you give us your gift, your reassurance as we go into a new year. Amen. If anybody would like to come up for prayer, you're welcome to just sit in one of these pews and I'll anoint you. And JR may do that the first Sunday. It's perfectly fine to get it two, two services in a row. I know I can always use anointing. We'll just fill up the first pew, and if anybody else wants to come, you can be in the second. Let's use the first two pews. If they fill up, we'll use three pews. There's no limit to the number of people. We need to go to the third one? Let's go to the third one. Okay, so it's the first three pews. I invite the rest of you, feel, if you feel comfortable, to come forward and either extend your hands or put the hand on the shoulder of any one of these people. Or you can do it from your seat, whatever you prefer. I want this to be a group prayer. My sister, I anoint you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. My sisters, I anoint you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. My sister, I anoint you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Brother, I anoint you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. My sisters, I anoint you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. My sister, I anoint you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. I anoint you, my sister, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. I anoint you, my brother, in the name of the Father, my 
sister, in the name of the Father. As you go into 2016, I want you to remember this image of people sitting here requesting prayer for whatever the need is. We don't have to know what it is. And your church family extending hands over you. Okay? Because God is not limited by time. So this prayer is not just in this moment, in this second. This prayer is an eternal prayer. So those of you in the first three pews, I want you to feel covered by this prayer from now on, okay? You've got, not that it's about numbers, but you have about a dozen people praying over you, okay? Really cool. I just think it's really cool. It's a neat gift. So thanks you to, thank you to all of you for participating. Heavenly Father, as we lift our hands over these that have asked for prayer, we ask your special guidance on them and all of us as we go into a new year. I can't think of any better way for us to start a new year than to come into your house and ask for your blessing and your strength, your grace. And God, we know that when, if, if only two or three were gathered, you would be in our midst, and we know that you answer prayer. There's no prayer that you love to answer more than just when someone comes before you, open, ready to receive what you have, just asking for your blessing. So I thank you for their faith and their witness in coming and asking for prayer and trusting you in exercising the faith that you put in their hearts. So God, go with them in this new year. I know that you will, but I pray that they will feel it. I claim that they will see evidence of it. I claim that this is going to be a special year. It's not going to be perfect. Other people have free will. They hurt us. They do their own thing. There are natural disasters. Things break. I don't know why this is not a perfect world, God, but I do know this is not heaven. This is not home. But you do have a home prepared for us. And there's nothing that's going to happen in 2016 that you can't handle. There's nothing in 2016 that you don't already know about. There's nothing in 2016 that you're not already prepared for, prepared for lining up what we're going to need so we can keep holding on to you. So I thank you, God, that you're going to be our God in 2016, and that you're going to shepherd each and every one of these, no matter what they go through, you are their shepherd. You created them, you crowned them with glory and majesty. Jesus came for them, died for them, made heaven available to them. Thank you. Thank you for everyone who's here. Thank you for their gift of prayer for one another. In Jesus' name. So as we get ready to leave, it's a very important worship service in our community. As we get ready to depart, they're going to celebrate us with fireworks and noise all around. So just remember, that's about you. And this handout has Judy's beautiful prayer. It has the scripture readings for you to meditate on, and it has the slides. So I hope it will be a gift that you can use in your prayer life this year. <clears throat> and I think I have some more. I do have more. You got one. Okay, so everybody has one. You got one? Okay. Anybody need an extra to give to anybody? have a few extras. You have enough? Okay. So happy new year. Happy new year. We have about <laughs> 10 more minutes. <laughs> So let's say the benediction to each other. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And I pray that you take Christmas and the spirit of Christmas into the new year.
Happy New Year.